Okay. This morning, I wanted to deal with a very basic idea. Uh, what is mid-ax Pauline dispensational right division? Uh, with the secondary question of, are we a cult? And uh, I can tell you, first of all, we're not a cult, but I definitely can't spell very well on your outline there. There's no E on the we. But um, uh, we need to deal with this basic issue. And I think this is a question that people may have who are exposed to grace ambassadors or, or whether it be some of the material we hand out when it talks about rightly dividing or, or we have a book that call, is called The Basics of mid of Sensationalism. What is this? Who are we? Um, where do you come from? Who taught you this? You know, these basic questions that people ask, we need to deal with this. And so whether it's, it's you have questions about this, I want to make sure we're on the same page with it, or whether other people ask you these questions, we'll know how to, to, to answer that. And so um, when we're at the fairs, one of the, the good things about going to the fairs and doing evangelism work is that it really uh, exposes you to the need of people for Jesus Christ. And of course, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, this is why we need mid ex Pauline dispensational right division, because we need to understand not just Jesus, but how we preach him. Right? We preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We can't just preach Jesus any old way. The Muslims preach Jesus. The Catholics preach Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses preach Jesus, and they were at both fairs that we were at. Uh, unfortunately, at the one fair, the only other religious booth besides us trying to promote a message was the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so they're preaching Jesus, and they got Bible literature and know Jesus and things like this, but it's, it's teaching him wrongly. You know, they teach a, a wrong a doctrine of Jesus. And so uh, when we're ministering at the fairs, there, there's just a, a need, you see, for people, for Jesus Christ and the gospel, clearly explained. And men ex Pauline dispensationalists are in a unique position to explain the gospel clearly. You who know how to rightly divide the scripture, how to find the gospel in the Bible, you are able to explain clearly to other people what it means to be saved, how a soul is saved, okay? Because you understand what it's not from the Bible. So that when someone says, well, I thought it was John 3, 16, I thought it was Acts 2, 38, I thought it was John 14, you can, you can understand the difference there and explain that to them and say, well, no, God revealed his grace here. And this is what salvation is. This is the gospel. And so when we're out there ministering, that's, that's the level that you minister on in, in public quite a bit. It's just the gospel level. When we come here, we tout ourselves as mid ex Pauline dispensationalists. We're right dividers. We're grace believers. We are these things that are so foreign to people. And uh, if you were at the booth and you were, we had a giant sign, which we don't, that said mid ex Pauline dispensationalists, we'd get more strange looks than we already get. Uh, at the top of our booth, we just have a Bible verse, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved. You know, and we have some provocative tracts and, and signs and things about uh, uh, Bible topics and church topics. But if we had that as our title, mid ex Pauline Dispensationalist, wow, people would, we're not that. Uh, and so I, I had the idea this last week of creating a tract because of the looks that I often get at the fair. And, and maybe it's just me. I, other you helped out this week, so you tell me if it's just me and you don't get these looks. Maybe they're looking at me this way. But you get these looks of suspicion, like what kind of cult are you in, you know? And so I thought, what a great idea for a track. I can make a track that says, please join our cult. And uh, you hand it to people who give you that look, and they're going, huh, all right. Because you, you've never received a track that says, please join our cult before. Because nobody thinks they're a cult. You know, Joe Witnesses, they're Christians, right? Mormons are Christians. Everyone's a Christian. Now, I'm the only one that's going to say, please join our cult. Because I want them to think about what that means. How do you know if I'm a cult or not? You know, and of course, the track, I published the article on Saturday in the email. The tract would include what we actually believe and teach, which is the gospel clearly, which is that you're not under law, you're under grace. The priest doesn't have authority over you. You, you have personal responsibility and liberty in Christ. So none of these teachings are cultic. You know, none of these teachings are things that would bind you uh, and keep you captive to some sort of manipulated doctrine. And these are all things that make you free, give you understanding. And so hopefully people would read that and say, oh, well... These guys aren't a cult, and you know what? My church doesn't do these things here. Maybe my church is more cultic than these people. And that would be the idea of the tract. But I only bring that up as an illustration because too many people, when you say we rightly divide, when you quote scripture, when you say we're dispensational, their initial reaction is kind of like that. Well, what kind of cult are you in? You know, you look like a cult to people. Because you quote the Bible. You know the Bible, you quote verses to them. Because you say things contrary to tradition, right? Like you don't have to be water baptized. At all. You don't have to be water baptized. We're baptized, not with water. And this is strange. Everybody thinks baptism is water. 
When you say things like, well, the gospel is found in Paul's epistles. What? Like Paul's our apostle. Revelation of the mystery. Dispensation of grace. These are phrases from the scripture. People aren't aware of the scripture, and so they, you sound very strange to them. This is a consequence, of course, because of our culture of people being biblically ignorant. I mean, they don't know the Bible, and so you're trying to speak Bible language, and they're going, what are you talking about? That's not how my pastor talks. Right? What, are, what are you saying? And so, again, you sound very strange to people. And so, uh, what does it mean to be a mid-ex Pauline dispensationalist? What, is this, what are we actually saying? People don't know the Bible. They don't know history, <coughs> Christian history, American history. They don't know history in general. Um, um, they don't know doctrine. Doctrine has been de-emphasized ever since the late 1800s, and now I'm boring people. <laughs> ever since the late 1800s, in which uh, liberal Christianity, they wouldn't call themselves liberal, liberal, but liberal Christianity changed the conversation from doctrine to life. And they said, it's not about doctrine. Christianity is not a doctrine. Christianity is a lifestyle. Christianity is a life. And so if you're emphasizing doctrine, this is just, it's just academic. Christianity should be living. And that was the liberal Christian idea, those who denied the fundamentals of the faith, denied the Bible, denied Jesus, and this sort of thing. But that crept into the rest of Christianity so that now it's a common place to say, Christianity is not doctrines you believe. Christianity is the way you live. Well, actually it's not at all. It comes from a book filled with teachings and instructions about how to live. Okay, we learned before about what hope is, how to love about you know, marriage, about uh, your life as a person, about humanity, about governments, about church, about all these things are taught to us from the scripture, okay, without which we wouldn't know the truth. So we, we need not be ignorant of the Bible or history or doctrine, but most people are. And so again, you're in a position of being strange. When people try to find out who you are, they'll uh, Google you. I remember one of the, the first uh, times uh, I was exposed, I guess, as a grace believer. Uh, a, a pastor looked us up on the internet. You know, tried to look up what I taught and what I believed on the internet. You know, and this is always a fun experience because you don't know what you're going to get on the internet, especially when Google filters the searches based on your past searches. And it's, whoa, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, so he looked us up and says, according to the internet, uh, you're teaching heresy. And I said, wow, that's interesting. If the internet were my authority, then I guess maybe I'd listen to that. But um, that's what people do. They look you up on the internet, and they try to find out, where did you learn this? Where does this come from? What are you? you know, they're trying to put a label on you. And there's nothing wrong. I'm going a little countercultural here. There's nothing wrong with putting a label on someone to try to figure out who they are. You know? No one wants to have a label, and I understand that. Um, even we don't like to label ourselves. We have no denomination. right? We're not a part of the denomination. We don't call ourselves Baptist or Methodist. President. We don't have a denomination called Grace Believing mid ex Pauline Dispensation. There isn't one. So what are you? I mean, you're not adjoined with anybody. You're not part of a denomination. What do we call you? What do you believe? Where's your statement of faith? Where's your creed? Um, and that's been part of the focus of the website, is trying to, you know, with Grace Ambassadors, to try to explain to people what is mid-ex Pauline Dispensationalism, what is it we teach. At the very top right of the corner of the website, there's a link, what is mid-ex Pauline Dispensationalism. And they can click on that and get a, a quick summary. There's also an abundance of resources, I think maybe too much now, or, uh, that people can search around. Um, we're going to try to reorganize that a bit, and try to make it clear for people to, to and guide them towards an introductory understanding of it. But people try to find out what we are, and um, since we have no denomination that tells people what we are, you know, there's no statement of faith, no central organization, we get labeled with things that we don't really like. We get uh, called things that we don't really associate with. Uh, or the names people give us are, are inadequate. Um, you ever heard of ultra-dispensationalists? Yeah, hyper-dispensationalists. Um, people call us this. So you look it up on the internet, there's Wikipedia articles on ultra-dispensationalism. And you read it, and it's not written by an ultra-dispensationalist. It's not written by you and I. So if anybody wants to have a Wikipedia ministry, you know, have at it. Uh, change, correct that thing. I mean, it's not talking about us. I don't know who it's talking to, but that's what they think is us. You know, and... and you could say, I guess we're close to that, but it's not what we're teaching. So it's misrepresentation. Hyper grace, which I dealt with a couple weeks ago on the article. Someone at the fair said, are you a hyper grace person? Are you hyper grace? Well, I, I had read about that term before, so I knew where he was coming from. But this is just a label that's been uh, imposed on us. You're hyper grace. Well, actually, Romans 11:6 6 says, you know, if it's grace, it's not works. And if it's works, it's not grace. I mean, it's either grace or not grace. It's really that simple. It's not a hyper or not. 
And of course, God revealed to Paul the dispensation of grace in Romans 5, verse 20. says grace abounds and grace reigns. And I mean, so I don't know how much more grace you need to be hyper, but there's a lot of grace, apparently. But this is a label placed on us, but that doesn't adequately really describe what we teach. Even right dividers, which is something we often call ourselves. I try to explain to people. I met someone the other day, and he knows how to rightly divide. He's a right divider. What does that mean? What does that really mean? In some circles, that means something, but doesn't really encompass what we're talking about. So it's kind of inadequate. Um, in case you're not familiar with, with, with right division, um, there is a grace movement that now is kind of blurry and vague and doesn't really define itself either. But, you know, and, and they like to call themselves right dividers. But 2 Timothy 2.15 has been used by many people that are not what you and I would refer to as similar Pauline grace believers, um, mid access dispensationalists. They're not that. You know, so Baptists say they rightly divide. In fact, one of the responses to Brother Stam, who wrote the book Things That Differ, to try to describe the fundamentals of mid-axis sensationalism, uh, you know, some 60, 70 years ago, one of the responses to him back 70 years ago was wrongly dividing the word of truth by a Baptist minister, Harry Ironside, and among others who had a similar title. And the idea was that they knew that they needed to rightly divide the scripture. They were just claiming he was wrongly dividing it, you see. So the, the teaching of needing to rightly divide the scripture has been taught by many people. And so to say we rightly divide and that's our claim, that's our niche, that's our unique, well it's not our uniqueness. You know, in some circles it may articulate something but it's not what makes us unique. It doesn't define what we are. It just describes something that we need to do. Okay. Bereans, of course, has its own problems. In Acts chapter 17, the Bereans were more noble because they didn't kill Paul. And they actually opened up their Old Testament scriptures, but they were all Jews. And as far as we know, only one Brian ever believed what Paul taught, and that was Sopater, I believe. Later, he followed Paul around. But we never hear from the Brians again. In, Thess in Thessalonica, it was the Thessalonians who actually got two letters written to them where Paul praised them for the communication of faith that they had. So there, there's issues with that. And Brians, just like right dividers, or grace believer, or grace teaching, um, again, th these are things that we give our self names but uh, they don't really tell people what we teach. There is a, I don't want to confuse everything, but there, there are grace movements outside the grace movement. Does that make sense to you? Okay. The, the hyper grace label, for example, was imposed in the holiness camp. The, you know, holiness teachers, Pentecostal, Charismatics, Methodist. Okay. It was in that camp that the hyper grace label was created on other holiness teachers who found Paul and was teaching Romans 6 in their holiness groups. Now, holiness is a little contrary to grace because holiness teaches you have to live it. teaches you've got to keep it and you've got to earn it. And so to teach Paul, Romans 6, that, you know, it's grace. This is a breath of fresh air for a lot of those folks. It's becoming popular in some circles with Joseph Prince and other places. Okay? And so they call them, those people, hyper grace. But those people are not, well, you and I would know mid sensational. They're just not. But they're preaching Paul and they're preaching grace. You see, so, you see what I'm saying, how that <clears throat> these labels don't adequately define what we are. And thus, the question, what is mid ex and dispensationalism? What are we? There's no denomination that says, are you a part of this denomination? And if you are, this is what you believe and teach. And it's a reason why we don't have denominations. But what in the world are we? Okay. And I wish we could just be called Christians. Because <laughs> I don't want to have some sort of strange, cultic-sounding thing, you know. Well, I'm a you know, a five-point Calvinist, you know, two-seed in the spirit, predestinarian, you know, these names are created to define what doctrinal positions they hold, right? They're helpful, but they're very, they're not useful in society. You know, I'm a Christian. I, I believe the Bible. I have faith in God. I mean, but again, these things don't distinguish me from anybody else, right? There's one asks, who are you? And you say, I'm a Christian. That doesn't help. <laughs> it doesn't help, not in America anyway. And so, <clears throat> you want to be called that, but these names don't work. So can we be, another issue that raises, is raised on the table is, you know, talking about mid axis dispensationalism is, can we be Baptist and mid axis Pauline dispensational? Can we be Pentecostal and mid axis dispensational at the same time? I mean, if there's no denomination, and we're just kind of free and the gates are open, can we be two things at once? I mean, is there really that much difference? Can a, like I mentioned before, Baptists were rightly dividing before mid ex Pauline dispensationals were rightly dividing. So can you be a Baptist right divider? Can you be a Presbyterian grace teacher? You see? You see the problem here. Can you be both? What is it that describes what it is we teach? What are we doing here? 
why don't we join up with the Presbyterians? They got more money, or the Baptists, you know, they got more water, or, you know. And, <laughs> and why don't we do that? There's more people. What are we doing? What makes us unique? Can we still be Pauline? What is the next Pauline dispensational? So I've raised the question. Hopefully I've articulated that clear enough. So I want to go through here briefly just what the term means, mid-Acts Pauline dispensational right division, where this comes from. And before we get to that, we need to talk about what the major impact is of mid-Acts teaching. Okay, what impact does it really have? When you talk about what is it and what difference does it have in the marketplace of ideas, you need to figure out what really is the impact. And uh, I'm going to use a theological term here, and I put the definition on the, on the, the outline, is that the impact of what we're teaching differently. It doesn't sum up everything we teach, but the thing we're teaching that's unique from other people. The impact is ecclesiological. That's a theological term referring to the church, the teaching and doctrine of the church. What the church is supposed to be doing, what the church looks like, what's the mission for the church, what's the purpose for the church, what's the everyday practices of the church, people in the church. How do you get into the church? You know, does this sound familiar to you, these topics? This is the area of theology that in systematic theology and theologians they call ecclesiology, the study of the church. What is the doctrine of the church? And it's this area that mid-Acts doctrine has the biggest difference, the biggest impact in thinking that is different. It's in these questions about the church that we differ from other Christians. Okay? And we'll see why I make that point later, because it's not in areas of theology like salvation that we differ. Am I right? Now, we understand that by understanding the Bible rightly divided, the gospel becomes clearer, and so we present it clearer. But we're not the only ones that have ever taught salvation by grace through faith in Christ's finished work. You've heard people who believe that. Mid-Acts doesn't invent that. Mid-Acts doesn't have an impact on that. I mean, you can still teach that gospel anywhere. Mid-Acts clarifies that. That separates the, the wrongness. But, but it doesn't change salvation, the fundamental of Christianity there. It doesn't change our Christology. Christology is the... The, the doctrines uh, 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 studying who Jesus Christ is. Was he God? Was he man? What, how does that work together? This doctrine is, is totally unaffected by mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalism. I mean, You've got to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, you may think, oh, we're mid-Acts. We can teach you anything we want about Christology. No, you're a heretic if you do that. You are a cult if you do that. You see, mid-Acts dispensationalism has a place that makes it different, but it's built upon... Fundamental doctrines that are no different than other, other Christians that, are, that believe the Bible, right? Speaking of the Bible, we believe the Bible. Is that unique with us? I hope not. <laughs> Neither does mid-Acts specifically address that. Now, you, you must believe your Bible to get to the, to conclude and result in the mid-Acts position, but there are other Christians that say they believe the Bible. There are other Christians that sincerely think that this is God's word and that sincerely say, I want to understand it, or sincerely say, we need to take it literally. This is not a new thing. Okay. So again, if you know the, the history of Christianity, especially the last couple hundred years, it's the result of people saying, we believe this Bible literally, that we get to the conclusion of Pauline right division. You see? That's how we get to where we're at. It's not come, it doesn't come out of, of the blue sky. It comes from that idea of believing the Bible and taking it literally. You see? So, anyway, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But we're trying to identify what is it that makes us unique. We call ourselves Grace Ambassadors, is the name of our church, Grace Ambassadors Bible Fellowship. And that word ambassadors helps a little bit because that word is only used in the New Testament in Paul's epistles. And so it's something that Paul uses to describe his ministry work in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. He says, We're ambassadors for Christ, and we beseech you. And he talks about the ministry of reconciliation and how that. Christ was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so this ministry that was given, Paul says, to us from the Lord, he uses that term ambassadors. And of course, that has other uh, implications with doctrine as well about what the church is and what they're supposed to do. And so that, that's interesting. That maybe hit the mark a little closer because only Paul uses the word. He, some denominations call themselves disciples, like disciples of Christ, right? Well, this is not a word that Paul uses, right? Which is why those of us who are Pauline sometimes feel a little, a little tug. Maybe we shouldn't use that word. Why? Because you don't read it in Paul's epistles. That's why. It's not that it's a bad word. It's just you realize it's not Pauline. And so you see, we're, we're trying to circle what makes us us. 
Ephesians 6, verse 20, Paul says he's an ambassador in bonds. In Ephesians 6, verse 20. But why is he in bonds? In verse 19, it says, he was making known the mystery of the gospel. He says, pray for me that I may, uh, that for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that there I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, those of you who are mid ex and dispensational, doesn't that make sense to you? That Paul is preaching the mystery of the gospel, and that's what he's praying for that we ought to do, and that you know, he's an ambassador in bonds, and he ought to speak to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3, verse 9. And this is, this is closer to home now. What is mid ex Pauline dispensational? Well, we're ambassadors, right? Or are we citizens of an earthly kingdom? You see the difference? Maybe that helps, being an ambassador, but we call ourselves grace ambassadors. What does mid ex mean? mid ex do I go around telling people I'm mid ex You know, you say that to people, they don't even know what you're talking about. Axe? At, at the fair, or in Madison County, it was hilarious. I know Pam told me this, and, and Dad was telling me, when they hand out balloons, they ask people simple Bible questions, and one of the simple Bible questions they ask people is, how many books are in the Bible? And I think the average answer was like four or five. Two. two was, <laughs> yeah, there was two, yeah, or four or five or six or 12, you know. Uh, but it, it, again, it's just a display of how much people don't use the scripture. But um, what I mean by bringing that up is simply that when you say you're mid-Acts, I mean, try telling that person you're mid-Acts. How many books in the Bible? Uh, four? Well, I'm a mid-Acts dispensation. What are you talking about? They don't even know the book of Acts exists in the Bible. And you're mid-Acts, whatever that means. It doesn't help anybody. You say, but this is on the book. This is what we call ourselves. What does this label mean, mid-Acts? Let's just drop that thing, right? I mean, but we need it. You say, why do we need it? It's like the, it's like the thing nobody wants. It's an important description because it protects you from the errors doctrinally of thinking that the church began at Pentecost or the church begins in Acts 28, which is the other extreme, which is probably, which, by the way, the Acts 28 position is typically what people blast when they call us ultra-dispensationalists. They totally miss the mark. They, they drive right past us and say, those, those ultra-dispensationalists are wrong. We go, yeah, we agree with you. That's not what we teach. They're Acts 28. They're not mid-Acts. So mid-Acts is important to distinguish us from those. But very few people have that conversation between Acts 2 and Acts 28. I mean, how many people do you talk to about that? I mean, I, I hope you, you're able to, and I hope you understand that. So it's, it's one of those things where it's important, but you never really want to show someone that it's... it's I, I thought about it. It's kind of like the Second Amendment. Second Amendment, you know, the right to bear arms. Important to have. Not something you really need to show everybody at dinner, right? Welcome to my house. <laughs> You know, I don't really need to do that, but you realize the importance of it. So this is like the mid-axe label. I mean, it's important doctrinally, and when you need it to protect you from air, you need to bring that thing out, right? But it's not going to help really if you're trying to minister to someone the gospel. So, um, but it's there. It's in contrast to the red letters because we're in the book of Acts. It's where the apostle Paul gets saved in Acts chapter nine, and so we know it's in the Acts of the apostles in that book in that time frame is the idea when the Apostle of Grace, the Apostle of the Gentiles, receives the revelation of the mystery, which, for which he was an ambassador in bonds. And so that's why mid-Acts, not beginning of Acts. So we would say the dispensation of grace, the revelation of the mystery, was not given at Acts 2 at Pentecost. They did not understand the mystery then. right? Neither was it not revealed until Acts 28. It was known by Paul and ministered to churches in the book of Acts and Paul's ministry. We have mid-Acts. It next refers to when this dispensation began. In 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, this book is a book written in the Acts period, in the book of Acts. And it's in this time period that Paul says, if I do this thing willingly, here speaking about his preaching ministry, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So Paul uses that word dispensation. He says, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Well, when was it committed to him? After his salvation and afterward. It was his ministry. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, Jesus Christ himself says that Paul is a chosen vessel to, to be a minister for him, to, to the kings and to Israel and to all the Gentiles. He was a chosen vessel of the Lord in Acts 9, verse 15. 
And so if Paul was the chosen vessel of the Lord to minister to the Gentiles, if Romans 11, 13, Paul says he's the, the, the apostle of the Gentiles, then where was that ministry before Acts 9? And the answer is it wasn't there. There was no ministry to the Gentiles before Acts chapter 9. It was all through Israel. Okay, so something started here at Acts 9. A revelation, a dispensation of the gospel was committed to Paul. Okay, and it began with him, and he uh, ministered to Gentiles and started churches uh, and wrote epistles to them. Acts 26, verse 16, uh, is this place where Paul, again, is referring to his salvation testimony in Acts 9 when the Lord appeared to him. And he says something interesting here in Acts 26, because on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus tells Paul to rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of the things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. So the Lord Jesus Christ appears to Paul multiple times and reveals to him this information from Acts 9 to Acts 26 about what he's supposed to minister to Gentiles, minister to the world, minister to the church. Okay? And so we learn uh, that this dispensation began with the Apostle Paul, um, and thus mid-Acts. Move on to dispensation. The word dispensational, or mid-Acts dispensational, well, dispensational just speaks to the idea of understanding that God's revelation, his Bible, is to be understood progressively. Dispensational is the idea that when God dispenses information, he reveals the information about how we ought to respond to him, that we need to study the Bible that way. Hebrews 1 verse 1 says that God at sundry times in diverse manners spake, and then he's talking there about the prophets and speaking to them, but the idea in Hebrews 1 1 is that God speaks at different times to in different ways, to different people, about different things. And so the Bible is not just a single book written to all to you, that you just open up and all of it applies to you. It's not all for your participation, it's a dispensational, we understand that. But you understand, you're not the first dispensationalist to walk to earth. You know that. Mid-Acts dispensationalists aren't the first dispensationalists. In fact, the, way, the reason we have to call ourselves mid-Acts dispensational is because there are dispensationalists who are not mid-Acts. You understand? So there are dispensational Bible teachers out there, many of them, who are not mid-Acts dispensational. And so sometimes you think, well, nobody understands God's dispensation. Well, a lot, there are people who understand dispensations. Okay, They don't really take a bold stand on it because they don't see the practical application of it. And we'll get to that here in a moment. Because it has a practical application. It has an impact on how Christians ought to be but they study it out, and they're, they're dispensational. They're not mid-act dispensational. Ephesians 3, verse 2 through 4, clearly, Paul says, a dispensation of the grace of God was given to me, to you, word. He talks about a mystery that was hidden from ages past. So, clearly, the scripture speaks about dispensations from God. Even covenant theologians, and this is something you need to be aware of. Okay, you look up systematic theologies like Louis Burkhoff or some of these covenant reformed guys, and in their theologies, they have sections talking about God's dispensations. It was not John Nelson Darby. It was not Scofield. It was not Brother Stam. It wasn't us that invented the idea that God spoke to different people and had different dispensations. Christians have been studying this for a long time. They just haven't used it appropriately. And that's where it's going to come down to what makes us different. We're using it differently. Well, we'll get to that in a moment here. But we're mid-acts, we're dispensational. You know, systematic theologies, you all know what systematic theologies are? Big, thick books that only pastors have, I guess. I'd encourage you to get one, maybe, if you, you're, you like that sort of thing. It, it's supposed to be a, a, an exhaustive resource of Christian doctrine. That's what it is. See, I thought the Bible was that. Well, yeah, yeah the Bible is. But these theologians take the Bible and they try to categorize and systematize all the teachings of the Scripture so that you can read the systematic theology and understand everything about God, man, sin, salvation, the church, end times, everything, just in this book. Okay. Unfortunately, there hasn't been very many dispensationalists writing these types of books. Most of them are covenant and reformed people, the scholars, you know, right? the theologians that are trained in doing that. But, but you pick up one of these books and you'll see all the doctrines divided into different categories. That's why I mentioned earlier the, the category of ecclesiology or the church-related doctrines, which is, which is a different category than salvation-related doctrines. Right? But um, systematic theologies are weak in this area, dispensationalism. Because systematic theology has tried to take the whole Bible and categorize everything. It's kind of like that rainbow Bible. Anybody ever seen the rainbow Bible? 
it's, it's a Bible, it's got different, they highlight the verses in different colors based on different topics. So they try to systemize the whole Bible and say, well, this is a salvation verse, this is a you know, church verse. And, and people open it and say, oh, that'll help me, because then I'll understand at least the, the general idea of this passage. And you open it up, it looks like a rainbow, because in one chapter, orange, red, green, blue, you know, so apparently you're cutting up the whole chapter trying to figure out the topic. He's switching topics left and right. What's the problem with, with that sort of approach to the scripture? Is, what is salvation verses? I mean, you would say Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Romans chapter 3, verse 4, you know, 3 and 4. But what about in Jesus' earthly ministry? Are there salvation verses there? What about in the Old Testament? Are there salvation verses there? Because clearly in the Old Testament, they wouldn't be talking about Jesus Christ, but they had to have faith. Right? And there were times when God saves Israel from harm and things like that. So, you see, the problem with that is it does not respect God's progressive revelation. It just kind of categorizes things into topics. And so the weakness of systematic theologies is simply that they never, they prefer a, a unified approach. Everything in the scripture teaches the same doctrine. When actually the Bible is progressively revealed and there are things that change according to the dispensation. So this is an improvement that dispensationalists, and I'm now sounding very scholarly and maybe boring you all to death, this is an improvement of what dispensationalists can provide to systematic theologies. And, and I say all this knowing that we are just at the fair last week, and they don't even know the books of the Bible, let alone systematic theologies. But imagine a, a, a book of doctrine that respected the dispensations. So here's how God dealt with Israel, here's how God dealt through Christ in his earthly ministry, here's how God dealt with the church today. I mean, that would, that would be really helpful, I think. And we try to do that with, with our lessons, with the books we have back here. But anyway, my point here is simply that dispensationalism is taught by other people. It's something that respects God's progressive revelation. It's something that's needed to understand truth. And it's something a lot of Christians have tried to study for themselves before. This brings us to the term right division, mid ex dispensational right division. What does that mean, right division? You ever think about that? I mean, what does it mean? I mean, we can explain how, well, that's not for us, this is for us. You know, we, that's, that's before, this is now. And, uh, but it's really sometimes hard to articulate what it means, because everybody thinks they rightly divide, right? And you point the finger at someone else and say they wrongly divide. Everybody thinks they're wrongly divided the Bible. But this, this term really speaks to how we choose our verses, right? You realize that every Christian, everybody chooses a verse over another verse. They cherry pick, okay? There are some people who think they can do everything in the Bible and they just haven't read the Bible. <laughs> because you can't. There, there are things that contradict, contradictory instructions. And so those who've read the Bible and realize that, they say, well, is it that or is it that? Do I do this or do I do that? They realize they have to choose one or the other. Do we lose our salvation or do we not lose our salvation? You know, are, are we a nation or are we not a nation? Do we preach the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of the grace of God? Do, do I honor the law or do we not honor the law? Because you can find verses supporting both, right? And thus the controversies. So how then do we choose? Well, then this is where people open the Bible and they choose one or the other. They divide one from the other. They try to rightly discern or interpret the scripture. And so every Christian does this. And so this is why I said earlier, it's a very inadequate description of what makes us unique. Oh, we're right dividers. Yes, so is everybody else. I mean, they're all picking verses. Yeah, we do it right. That's what they say. All right? I mean, everybody tries to pick verses. Okay, so it, it, it really just is a general description of how people choose marching orders, and we happen to choose our marching orders with Paul, which I'm going to advocate is a more clear description of what makes us us. Right division. Is this important thing to call ourselves? Mid-Acts, we already saw that's something we don't want to bring out every dinner. Dispensationalism. This sounds scholarly, right? Long word there. Right division. This is, sounds more like a motto. This is good, right? But it really doesn't clearly explain something to someone. You, you tell someone you're a right divider, no one immediately knows what you're talking about. Am I right? There's no denomination that says right dividing domination, and we all agree the same thing. No, there's not that. Among right dividers, there are different beliefs. So see, it doesn't really sum up things. What it may be important for, though, and I put this on there just for your consideration, is that um, some, one thing you do notice at the fairs as well is that when you put 2 Timothy 2.15, which is the verse we have on the top of our booth, you realize that not everyone's familiar with the verse. Why is that, you say? Because the word study, the first word in the verse, 
is removed from every other Bible except the King James Bible. They, ah, oh, again with the King James Bible. Well, I just thought I'd put it in here because I, I like right division and that calling ourselves right dividers for that point. If anything, to help us communicate the doctrine of preservation of the Bible. And I think uh, if grace believers will continue talking about right division and rightly dividing and studying, if, as long as that verse is a motto of the grace movement, whatever that is, they're going to continue to use the King James Bible. And for me, that's, that's a good thing. That's the Bible we ought to be using, you see. Because what happens when the day when the grace believer says, you know what, we rightly handle the Bible. We properly use the scripture. We show ourselves diligent. I've got to change all my tracks then, right? Got to change my poster then. So, some consideration there that the word dispensation is removed from other Bibles. The word study is removed. The, the phrase rightly dividing the word of truth is different in other Bible translations. So, if anything, it is an association with the King James Bible and thus the doctrine of preservation. Okay, so to preserve your own literature, you must preserve the Bible. Uh, but I think this leads us to really what is the difference, the significance. What makes us us? What is mid Acts Pauline dispensational right division? What is it? And I think you could sum it up with this one word right here. And it's, again, a word that sometimes we don't like to put out there. But it's Pauline. Okay, Pauline. What do you believe? What makes your church different? What does your church teach? Oh, we're Pauline. This really helps a lot. Because Pauline, what do you mean? Oh, well, we find the instructions for the church in Paul's epistles. We're Pauline in Paul's 13 books. Well, that sounds different. Yes, but now you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Then they'll ask, well, why is that? Well, now you have a conversation. What are you? We're right dividers. What does that mean? Well, let me draw a chart. You know, we're mid Acts. What does that mean? What Acts? What is that? Well, it's a book in the Bible, and you know, there's chronology, and you know, actually, Acts is talking about the fall of Israel. But you know, ignore that. You're dispensational. Oh yeah, so am I. No, you're not. You see, these things they don't really describe what we are. But we are mid Acts dispensational right dividers. We are. But Pauline, that is something perhaps we can carry on a banner. Remember, we're Christians, right? We follow Christ, and this is going to be the response you get when you say you're Pauline. Inevitably. And this is why we don't like saying it. What are you? We're Pauline. Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, I am too, but, you know, I just mentioned Paul. Sorry about that. Because the response you'll get is, well, I choose Jesus over Paul. Or I follow Jesus. Well, but that is the proper response you need to have. That's the conversation you need to have right there. Because you... Hopefully you know how to deal with, with the worshiping Paul issue. People always say, well, you worship Paul if you're saying you're Pauline. No, we don't. We don't worship Paul. Okay, God sent Moses with the law. God sent David with the Psalms. God sent Jesus on earth to Israel. And Jesus himself sent Paul to minister to the church. It's not that really that hard. We don't worship Paul. We worship Jesus. He's the only God manifest in the flesh. He is the Lord. He's the head of the body. In fact, no one talks more about Jesus Christ than Paul. In his epistles. And every Christian that is saved by God's grace and preaches the clear gospel, the same one we preach, gets it from Paul's books. Right? It shouldn't be a shame thing to be Pauline. In fact, Paul himself says, be not ashamed of me. Right? Or the gospel. And so being Pauline is what you are. You're Pauline. There's one thing that sums up our uniqueness, it's that. The Lord made Paul our pattern. And the verse on the top of your outline there is 1 Timothy 1.16, where Paul uh, uh, retells his testimony of salvation and says, For this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ, it's about the Lord, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. That's God's grace. When Paul was saved, it was unique. Not because of Paul, but because of how Christ saved him. Paul was a sinner, blatantly sinning, killing people who were following the Lord, and Christ saved him by his grace. Paul's salvation that the Lord provided was a pattern of salvation, a pattern of long-suffering. 1 Timothy 1.16 says Paul was, uh, that Christ showed forth all long-suffering through Paul for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So we believe on Christ. We get life everlasting from Christ. It's Christ who's trying to communicate to us through the pattern of Paul. I mean, is, that, is that right? Verse 1 16? And that's what makes us us. That's why we're different. Paul didn't do anything. It's Christ who saved Paul this way and sent Paul as a chosen vessel, and an apostle of grace, to write these epistles. And it's in his epistles we find the doctrine for the church. We're Pauline, right? You say, well, other Christians say they follow Paul too. But yes, we are Pauline, you see. We're not New Testament 
includes all of the Hebrew epistles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and or Pauline. This is going to clarify for people where you're coming from. In 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Paul says, be followers of me. He says, you have, no, you have many teachers, but you don't have many fathers. Paul says, I'm a father to you, Corinthians. I got you the message first. He says, follow me. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says, be followers of me, even as I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ sent Paul. We read his epistles, we learn from them, we get instructions from him. Paul says the, the instructions he gives, the commandments he gives in 1 Corinthians 14 are the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. So see, being Pauline does not mean you reject Jesus. It means actually you embrace Jesus and what he's doing today. You embrace Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul. You're Pauline. In Philippians 3, verse 17, this is the third time Paul says, Be followers together of me. Paul's not proud. He's not arrogant. He's not, he's not telling you to bow down and worship him. He's saying, God, give me a message. Christ, give me a message. Okay? So be prepared for the Jesus versus Paul issue. And just, you know, Jesus sent Paul. We worship Christ. But uh, that's what you are. You're Pauline. And so when you say that, you're Pauline. And after studying mid dispensational right division, People ask questions like, well, are you a cult? Right? Well, are we a cult? No, we're not a cult. Okay? Cults, cults corrupt the fundamentals of Christianity. And I mentioned earlier that the, the Pauline right division, being Pauline, being minax sensational, does not change your doctrine of Christ, Christology, who he is. He's still the same Son of God, Son of Man. Paul says in Romans 1, we preach this, that same Jesus who's the Son of God, Son of Man. It's that Jesus that we preach according to the mystery. So your Christology doesn't change. It's not when you become mid act suddenly you throw out the Baptist Christology. That's not it. Because that's the fundamental, that's the orthodox. You throw that out, you're not Christian anymore. Okay? I put theology and underline the T. This is what theologians call theology proper. It's the doctrine of God, the Godhead. Who is God? What are his attributes? Okay. This doctrine has absolutely no change when you become Pauline. It's the same. In fact, you learn more from Paul's epistles about it. But if people worship the Christian God, and the Christian God is the Baptist and Presbyterians teach him, you worship the same attributes of God as a mid ex Pauline dispensationalist. You see? It's no change. This ought to be reassuring to people because when they look at you and say, you sound like a cult, you can reassure them, no, no, no. We teach the same with Christology, the same theology about God, the Godhead, the same about the Bible, this being God's inspired word. There's no difference in that doctrine if you become Pauline. And I say this for your sake, say it for the sakes of people who are new, but also for the sakes of grace believers who think they can fiddle with those things when they become Pauline. As if because we become Pauline, now we can change everything about Christianity. And you can't. Because you're going to be a heretic when you do that. You see? It's not, being Pauline does not say, change everything. What, what does Paul, being Pauline affect? And we've taught before, well, being Pauline affects everything. And really, I say that because it seems like it does. Have you, have you felt that in your Christian experience? You, you learn right division, learn Pauline dispensationalism, and you go, wow, everything changed. Yeah, you have this huge shift, but actually the everything you're talking about is concerning the church. Because it's not everything about every Christian that's ever studied anything in the Bible. We're not some new thing created in the last hundred years. We still agree that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. We still believe in the hypostatic union. We still believe that God has all these attributes of, that we studied back in January. We still believe those things. We still believe this is God's word, all 66 books, all scriptures profitable. We still believe that. Okay. We still believe in pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit, that there's three persons to the Godhead. We still believe that. You see, we're Orthodox Christians who are Pauline. We're not a heretic. We're not a heresy. We're not a cult. Someone who denies the fundamentals of Christianity. We strengthen them. We strengthen them because we know what God is doing today. We know how the church ought to operate, what we're supposed to minister. And look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. There are people who teach another Jesus, and Paul says to avoid these people. We preach the same Jesus Peter did according to the revelation of the mystery. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. 
He fears that their minds would be corrupted in verse 3. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul says there are people who are preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. If they preach the wrong one, you should not go with them. You say, well, this means you have to know what the right one is. And so being Pauline means you need to understand what we believe about the Bible. So we studied it a couple months ago, the doctrine of the Bible. Revelation, inspiration, preservation. Remember all that? I mean, none of that was unique to Paul. That's just Christian doctrine. You should know that. Right? We studied back in January the attributes of God. That's not new with Paul. It's Christian doctrine. You got to know that. We studied the three-in-one God in January. That's been Christian doctrine for two, two millennia. So, Paul says that they preach another Jesus. If they get God wrong, or they get Jesus wrong, they get the Bible wrong, it's heresy. There was someone at the Howard County Fair. It was a po initially a positive experience where she came up and said, well, I agree with you guys, what you're saying here about half pastors don't believe the Bible. I agree with this and that. And suddenly come to find out, she was a heretic. She said, I, I agree with what you guys are saying about all this stuff here. Come to find out, she didn't believe in the Bible, the, the, the 66 books that I have. She didn't believe in these 66 books. She thought there were different books. That's called heresy. That's a fundamental Christian heresy. I mean, that's just wrong. We don't know where to talk from there. You can't agree with Pauline dispensationalism unless you first agree that we have the Bible right here. I mean, the two go together. You don't come to the conclusion of Pauline dispensationalism unless you have this Bible, unless you have the right Jesus, unless you have an understanding of who God is. You see, it affects that. Well, so we're not a cult. Are you a cult? No. This is what people ask when you say we're mid-acts, Paul. Are you a cult? No, we're not a cult. Not a cult. We're just on the cutting edge, you see. We're just, we're trying to improve Christianity. You see, that sounds cultish. <laughs> no, no. We're doing it from the Bible. I mean, we're just Pauline here. Okay. The church is broken, folks. The church is broken. Okay. And... Paul, uh, what Pauline doctrine brings to the table is an understanding of the church. What its mission is, what its gospel is, who it is, what its nature looks like, how it's supposed to operate. And that's why when you come to a Pauline church, what we're trying to create here, it's supposed to look differently. Because that's what Pauline doctrine affects. It impacts what people think the church is. Okay. We preach liberty. We preach biblical authority. We preach personal responsibility. We allow questions in our in our uh, meetings because we believe that you need to understand the Bible. We preach the gospel of God's grace through Jesus Christ, dying for your sins. All these things prevent us from being a cult. When we preach that you're able to understand the Bible for yourself, that the doors swing both ways, and you're not stuck here, and you know, I can make you some Kool-Aid, but it doesn't make you a cult member if you drink it. <laughs> you got orange juice too, whatever. It's about Bible doctrine, and we let you be persuaded in your own mind from God's word, which we try to preach you can believe and study on your own. That's not cultic. That's giving you the, the source material and saying, look, you, you read it. You believe it. And the only reason why people come to church here is if they believe and agree with the Pauline doctrine we teach. Right? That's not cultic. So we're not one. People say, who else teaches this? Well, the answer to that is everyone and no one. <laughs> because remember, we're Pauline, right? But who isn't Pauline to a degree? And Martin Luther discovered Romans 5, verse 1. And so we're justified by faith. We have peace with God. And he said, that's salvation right there, faith. And he believed that. And he saw the Roman Catholic Church was not teaching that. They were standing on James 2, 24. And whether Martin Luther knew it or not, he was being Pauline. And when he stood on what God was doing now, he was right. And there was a, a division in the Catholic Church, between the Protestants and the, the ones who remain Catholic, based on Romans 5, based on Paul. Now Martin Luther is far from what you and I would know today as being Pauline, because he didn't take it to its conclusion. He did not apply it all the way. But he applied it to salvation. And he said, ah, this salvation doctrine is troubling. And he, he read Paul and says, oh, that's it. And he learned salvation from being Pauline. There's a whole denomination called Lutherans. They follow Martin Luther. Right? And all of his rightnesses and all of his wrongs. <laughs> they follow Martin Luther. Right? We're Pauline. We follow Paul, it separates us from the Lutherans. Because Luther had things wrong. Because when he didn't follow Paul, he was wrong. You see? 
Who else teaches this? Well, the Baptists teach Paul, don't they? Don't the Baptists teach Ephesians 2, 8, 9? Say, by grace through faith, not of works? When they teach Paul, they're right. When they don't teach Paul, they're wrong. You're Pauline. You know that. That's why you can't be a Baptist. Because they're not Pauline. They take from Paul when they want to. And then they take from the red letters and they take from the Hebrew epistles. They're not Pauline. That's not their priority. They just use Paul. The Catholics use Paul. Right? They just prioritize James. All right, so everyone's Pauline. There, there are whole divisions of academia that are Pauline scholars. They study Paul, right? But they don't apply it to Christianity. They don't prioritize it. So everyone teaches Paul to a degree, right? The Pentecostals love 1 Corinthians 14, and Paul speaks about tongues. They love that chapter. But at the same time, no one teaches what we're talking about. I don't mean no, absolutely no one. I just mean small people, a small group of people. Because what we're talking about here is prioritizing Paul. Where Pauline, in his epistles, prioritizing his epistles that were inspired by the Holy Ghost, that Christ revealed to him as the practice for the church. That's what drives us. We believe all of Scripture is profitable in that Christ revealed to Paul in his epistles the doctrine, pattern, and destiny of the church. As C.I. Schofield wrote in 1917. You see? See, who else teaches this? Schofield did. Schofield wasn't a mid-Acts dispensationalist, but he wrote that in his book, his Bible. In Paul's epistles alone, we find the doctrine, destiny, pattern for the church. Right? Wow. He was right, right there. And he was wrong in the next, next page. <laughs> because he, he separated himself from Paul. You see, so when you prior, prioritize Paul's pattern for practice for the church, a lot of P's there, that's what makes you Pauline. Okay? And that's, that, that's where we, we get our our function. Where do you go to school? Where'd you learn this stuff? I've never heard this before. Well, you got to study history. Because like we said, dispensationalism is taught. Not mid acts dispensationalism. Right division is in the Bible. If you've got a King James Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. Right? But being Pauline, Paul's apostleship, this is where it begins for us. Okay? Study history. Dispensational right division is not new. It's just been misused. When you take dispensational thinking, and, a, and, and, and say, as Schofield said in his Bible, that there's more than one way to, to be saved. That's not right, and that's what's turned a lot of people off from dispensational Bible study. He said, there's two ways, there's more than one way to be saved. You can be saved by works or saved by grace. Is that even true? Can anyone be saved by works? No. Salvation's always by grace, through faith. And this is Pauline. <laughs> right? And so it's not true that they were saved by their works. Works were required. But you see, people have been turned off from it. They misuse the passages. When people in the 1800s and early 1900s were, were studying the Bible dispensationally, what was the most popular thing they were talking about when they discovered dispensational Bible study? They were talking about prophecy, Israel's return. Anybody studied this? They took the Bible literally and said, oh, Israel will return, God's promises will be fulfilled, and they started studying the end times. Right? Well, you know, that's, a, that's just a misuse of Pauline doctrine. I mean, take the Bible literally is good. Understanding that there's the church and Israel is a separation, that's good. But you know what? If focusing on Israel's return all the time, this is not the point of right division. What's the point of right division? To find out what God's doing today, not in the future. To find out what God's purpose is for the church, not for Israel in the future. You see, so when you apply it to the church today, that'll make a difference. Okay. It'll help you understand the rapture and tribulation and everything else. How can so many people be wrong? Well, everybody's wrong until they get it right. Right? <laughs> you were wrong. I was wrong. Everybody else is wrong. We're just learning here. We're starting from the scripture. Rightly divided. Tradition's a big thing. If you, again, you, if you know church history, there were, in the dispensational era of America, there were times when this was more popular than it is today. And there were popular pastors who rejected, they believed it, but rejected preaching it from the pulpit because the people in the pew pay their salary. And this, I'm not trying to impugn reputation. That's just the reality of the matter. And so they say, well, I believe it. I'm just not going to teach it because it's going to affect my denominational standing and my church and things like that. So they don't apply it. They don't apply it to their church. I mean, who is out there applying Pauline doctrine to their church? Well, hopefully we, we're doing that. I don't know who else is doing that. It's not just a teaching. It's a practical issue. You say, how can people be wrong? Well, the cutting edge is small. As I said before, the cutting edge, which is, I think, where we're at here, Pauline dispensationalism, 
it's small. If it was a big edge, it wouldn't cut so much. Is it really that important? It sounds divisive. Can't we just get along? I mean, you're trying to say that you're different than other people. Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. That Pauline understanding, being Pauline, means you're no longer a Baptist. If you're Pauline in your thinking and your Bible study, you're no longer a Methodist. You're no longer a Pentecostal. You're no longer whatever you were in your denominational setting because being Pauline changes everything about what you know about the church. And what's a denomination? The church. How do you operate your church? What's the church structure? Well, you know, what do you teach in your church? What's the mission of the, of the assemblies of God? Right? Well, you can't agree with the mission of the assemblies of God because their doctrine is different. But if you're Pauline, what's your mission? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Ephesians 3, verse 9. Make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. To be an ambassador for Christ. You're Pauline, you see. So you're no longer what you used to be. So we need to be comfortable with that. And that's what makes us different. And when people ask, what is mid-Acts dispensational right division? Being, saying being Pauline is a pretty good start, starting place. And that will help them understand what it, what it is that makes you different. Why are you so different? Oh, we follow Paul as Christ revealed to him the information. You go to the red letters and Paul and the Hebrew epistles and you just kind of take them everywhere. And that's why your church does what it does and this is why our church does what it does. You see, It's good to know those differences. And so um, it's good to know what it means to be Pauline dispensational. Any, any other questions? Any comments?